Hi YouTube. This evening we're going to continue the reading of Dragon Rider by Cornelia Funk. I hope you enjoyed the first two chapters. Today I decided to do it a little bit more casually and curl up here on the sofa with a cup of coffee and, um, and read it that way. So I hope you enjoy um, this more casual setup. So now we are starting on chapter three. And it says, chapter three, advice and warnings. Slatebeard was lying at the mouth of his cave listening to the rain when they arrived. You haven't changed your mind, he asked. Firedrake lay down beside him on the rocky ground. The young dragon shook his head. But I won't be alone. Sorrel's coming with me. Well, well, the old dragon looked at Sorrel. Good, she may come in useful. She knows human beings. She has a quick mind. And brownies are more suspicious by nature than dragons. Which won't be any bad thing on this journey of yours. Her big appetite could be a problem, but no doubt. She'll soon get used to eating less. Sorrel looked anxiously down at her stomach. Listen then, Slatebeard began again. I don't really remember very much these days. The pictures get more and more muddled in my mind, but I do know this. You must fly to the highest mountain range in the whole world. It lies far away in the east. And when you get there, you must find the rim of heaven. Look for a chain of snow-covered peaks encircling a valley like a ring of stone. As for the blue flowers growing in the valley, he added, closing his eyes, their fragrance hangs so heavy in the cold night air that you can taste it. He sighed. Ah, oh, my memories are faded now, as if they were lost in the mist, but it's a wonderful place. His head sank to his paws, he closed his eyes, and his breath came more slowly. There was something else, he murmured. But Slaybeard only shook his head sleepily. I don't remember, he murmured, but beware, he said, his voice so soft they could hardly hear it. Beware of the golden one. Then a snore emerged from his muzzle. Fire Drake straightened up, looking thoughtful. What did he mean by that? asked Sorrel anxiously. Come on, we'd better wake him up again and ask him. But Fire Drake shook his head. Let him sleep. I don't think he can tell us any more than he's told us already. They left the cave quietly, and when Fire Drake looked up at the sky, the moon was visible for the first time that night. Oh, good, said Sorrel, holding her paw up in the air. At least it stopped raining. Suddenly she clapped herself on the forehead. Oh, fearsome fungi, she swiftly slipped off Fire Drake's back. I must pack some provisions. How do we know there won't be mushroom shortages where we're going? Back in a moment, and don't you dare, she added menacingly, wagging a furry finger in Fire Drake's face. Don't you dare even think of starting without me. With that, she disappeared into the dark. Now listen, Fire Drake, said the rat anxiously. You really don't know much about what you're looking for. You're not used to navigating by the stars, and Sorrel's mind is usually so full of mushrooms that she couldn't get north and south mixed up and confuse the moon with the evening star. No, it won't do, Rat stroked her whiskers and looked at the dragon. You need help. Believe me, as it happens, a cousin of mine makes maps, very special maps. He may not know exactly where the Rim of Heaven is, but he can certainly tell you where to find the highest mountain range in the world. Stop off and see him on the way. I have to admit, visiting him isn't entirely without its risks, said the rat, wrinkling her brow, because he lives in a big city. But I think you ought to chance it. If you set off soon, you can be there in two nights' time. City? The indistinct figure of Sorrel emerged from the mist. For goodness sake, must you scare me to death? asked Rat. Yes, that's right. My cousin lives in a human city. When you've left the sea behind you, you keep flying eastward inland, <clears throat> and you can't miss it. It's huge, a hundred times larger, a hundred times larger than this valley, and full of bridges and tall buildings. My cousin lives in an old warehouse on the river. Does he look like you? asked Sorrel, stuffing a few leaves in her mouth. She was carrying a bulging backpack, which she had brought back from one of her excursions into the world of human beings. Yes, of course he does. You rats all look the same, gray, gray, and gray again. Gray is a very practical color, spat the rat. Unlike your silly spots, as it happens, 
However, my cousin is white, Snow White, who wishes he wasn't. Do stop squabbling, said Fire Drake, looking up at the sky. The moon was now almost at its height, and if they were to set out that night, it was time to leave. I'm aboard, Sorrel, he said. Shall we take Rat, too, to give you someone to quarrel with? No, thanks. Rat took a couple of small steps backward in alarm. There's no call for that kind of thing. I'm perfectly happy to know the world at second hand. It's a lot safer. I never quarrel with anyone, Sorrel mumbled with her mouth full as she clambered up the dragon's back. Pointy-nosed persons are oversensitive. Fire Drake spread his wigs, and Sorrel hastily clutched one of the large spines on his chest. Look after yourself, Rat, said the dragon, bending his neck to nuzzle the little animal affectionately. It's going to be some while before I'll be back to keep you safe from wild cats. Then he stepped back, took off from the damp ground, and rose into the air, beating his wings powerfully. Oh no, groaned Sorrel, clinging on so tight that her furry fingers hurt. Fire Drake rose higher and higher into the dark sky, and a cold wind whistled around the brownie's pointed ears. I'll never get used to this, she muttered. Not unless I start growing feathers. <clears throat> She peered down cautiously at the valley below. None of them, she grumbled, not a single one has so much as put his neck out of his cave to say goodbye. The problem won't come out until they're up, up to their chin in water. Hey, Fire Drake, she called to the dragon. I know a nice little spot over there beyond those hills. Why don't we stick around here instead? But Fire Drake did not reply, and the black hills rose between him and the valley where he had been born. Chapter 4 a big city, and a small human being. Oh, pestiferous parasols, grumbled Sorrel. If we don't find somewhere pretty quick, they'll catch us and put us in the zoo. What's a zoo? asked Fire Drake, raising his, muscle from the wa his muzzle from the water. He had landed an hour ago in the big city, in the darkest part of it they could find, far from the streets that were full of noise and light. Even now, when night had fallen, Ever since, he had been swimming from one dirty canal to the next, looking for a place to hide during the day. But Hard and Sorrel strained her cat-like eyes and raised her sensitive nose to the wind. They couldn't find anywhere that was large enough for the dragon and didn't smell of human beings. Everything smelled of humans here, even the dark water and the garbage drift in it. You mean you don't know what a zoo is? Oh, I'll explain later, muttered Sorrel. Although, come to think of it, they're more likely to stuff us. Bother, it's going to take me hours to wash this filth off your scales. Fire Drake was swimming like a sli silvery snake along a dirty canal, under bridges, past the gray wall of buildings. Sorrel kept glancing uneasily at the sky, but there was no sign yet of the treacherous sun. There, the brownie suddenly whispered, pointing to a tall building. The water of the canal lapped its windowless brick walls. See that hatch? If you make yourself as thin as you can, you might fit through. Swim over there. I'll sniff around a bit. The dragon cautiously let himself drift toward the wall. A large loading hatch just above the water level gaped open. Its decaying wooden door hung loose from the hinges. With one bound, Sorrel jumped off Fire Drake's back, got a handhold on the rough cast wall, and put her head through the opening, snuffling. Seems okay, she whispered. There hasn't been a human being in here for years. Nothing but mouse droppings and spiders. Come on. In a flash, she had disappeared into the dark. Fire Drake hauled himself out of the water, shook his scaly body, and forced it through the hatch. He looked curiously around him at, the stru at this structure. The work of human hands. He had never been inside a building before, and he didn't like it. Large wooden crates and rotting cardboard cartons were stacked by the damp walls. Snarl sifted everything with interest, but she couldn't pick up the scent of anything edible. Wearily, Friar Drake dropped to the floor in front of the hatch and looked out. This was the first time he had made such a long flight. His wings, were, his wings ached, and the city was full of frightening sounds and smells. The dragon sighed. "'What's the matter?' Snarl sat down between his paws. Oh, I see. Who's homesick now, then? She opened her backpack, took out a handful of mushrooms, and held them under his nose. Here, get a nose full of these. They'll drive the stink of this place out of your nostrils. I expect our friend the rat would like it just fine here, but you and I... 
I'd better get out as soon as we can. She patted Fire Drake's dirty scales comfortingly. Get some sleep now. I'll have a bit of a nap, too, and then I'll be off to look for Rat's cousin. Fire Drake nodded, his eyes closed, when he heard Sorrel singing softly to herself. It was almost like being back in his cave. His tired limbs relaxed. Sleep was laying soft, soothing fingers on him, when Sorrel suddenly jumped up. There's something in here, she hissed. Fire Drake raised his head and looked around. Where? he asked. Behind those crates, whispered Sorrel. You stay here. She crept toward a stack of crates that towered to the ceiling. Fire Drake pricked up his ears. Now he could hear it, too. A rustling, a scraping of feet. The dragon raised himself. Come on out, said Sorrel. Come on out wherever you are. For a moment all was quiet, very quiet, except for the noises of the big city drifting in from outside. Come on out, spat Sorrel again. Do I have to come and fetch you? There was some more rustling, and then a human boy crawled out from among the crates. Sorrel retreated in alarm, and the boy rose to his feet, and he was a good deal taller than she was. She stared incredulously. He stared incredulously at the brownie girl, and then he saw the dragon. Friar Drake's scales still shone like silver in spite of the canal water, and in this small space he seemed enormous. Neck bent, he was gazing down at the boy in astonishment. The dragon had never seen a human being at close quarters before. From everything that Rat and Sorrel had told him, he had imagined they imagined them as looking different, very different. He doesn't smell of humans at all, Sorrel growled. She had recovered from her fright and was inspecting the boy suspiciously, although from a safe distance. He stinks of mice, she added. That's why I didn't smell him. Yes, that'll be it. The boy took no notice of her. He raised his hand, a bare hand with no fur growing on it, and pointed at Fire Jake. It's a dragon, he whispered. A real, live dragon. He gave Fire Drake an uncertain smile. The dragon cautiously stretched out his long neck toward the boy and sniffed. Sorrel was right. He did smell of mouse droppings. And there was something else as well. A strange smell. The same smell that hung in the air outside. The smell of human beings. Of course it's a dragon, said Sorrel crossly. And what are you? The boy turned to look at her in surprise. Oh, wow, he said. You're quite something, too. Are you an extraterrestrial? Sorrel proudly stroked her silky coat. I'm a brownie. Can't you see that? A what? A brownie, repeated Sorrel impatiently. Typical. You humans may be able to tell a cat from a dog, but that's about all. You look like a giant squirrel, said the boy, grinning. Very funny, spat Sorrel. What are you doing here anyway? A little titch like you isn't usually out and about on his own. The grin vanished from the boy's face as if Sorrel had wiped it away. A thing gummy, what's it, like you isn't usually out and about here either, he pointed out. And if you must know, I live here. Here? Sorrel looked around, raising an eyebrow. Yes, here, the boy glared at her. For now, anyway. But if you like, he added, looking at the dragon, if you like, you can stay here for the time being. Thank you, said Fire Drake. That's extremely kind of you. What's your name? The boy awkwardly pushed his hair back from his forehead. My name's Ben. What about you? This, said the dragon, nuzzling Sorrel gently in the stomach, is Sorrel, and I'm Fire Drake. Fire Drake, that's a good name. Ben put out his hand tentatively to stroke the dragon's neck, as if he feared Fire Drake would disappear the moment he touched. Casting the boy a suspicious glance, Sorrel went over to the hatch and looked out. Time to go and look for that rat, she said. You, human, can you tell me where the, Dock where the Dockland warehouses are? Ben nodded. Less than ten minutes walk from here, but how are you going to get there without being captured or stuffed or put on display in a museum? You can leave that to me, said Sorrel. Fire Drake put his head between the two of them, looking anxious. You mean it's dangerous for her? he asked the boy. Ben nodded. Of course. Well, looking the way she does, I bet she won't get ten meters from here. The first little old lady to spot her will call the police. Police? asked Fire Drake, baffled. What kind of thing is police? I know what the police are, muttered Sorrel, but
but I have to reach those warehouses, so it's just too bad. She sat down and was about to let herself drop into the city canal water when Ben grasped her by the arm. I'll take you there, he said. I'll give you some of my clothes to wear, and then I can smuggle you past somehow. I've been living here a long time. I know all the back alleys. Would you really guide her, asked Fire Drake? How can we ever thank you? Ben turned red. Oh, it's, it's nothing, really, he muttered. Sorrel was not looking so enthusiastic. Human clothes, she growled. Yuck! Dismal death caps! I shall stink of human beings for weeks! But she put the clothes on all the same. And that was chapter five. Sorry, that was chapter four. So um, we will continue this uh, later in the week uh, with chapters five and six. I hope you are enjoying Dragon Rider by Cornelia Funk. And I look forward to reading the next two chapters with you soon. It's creatively calm. Good night, you two.